Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Dr. Page is out of town, so he asked me to present our speaker for today. He will be back next week. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Tom Rook from Mayo Clinic. Dr. Rook is a professor of medicine at Mayo, and he's also the holder of the Krabi Professorship of Vascular Medicine. He's the director of the Vein Clinic, and he's also the co-director of the Ganda Vascular Center. He went to the University of Michigan for his undergraduate studies in physiology and then to Johns Hopkins for medical school. He did an internship in the Department of Physiology and Biophysics before starting his residency and fellowship in cardiovascular medicine at Mayo. When he was done with his training, he joined Mayo's faculty as an assistant professor of medicine, and five years later he became an associate professor, and in 2000 he became a full professor. His research interest started very early. As a medical student, he was awarded the Sarnow Fellowship, which is a very uh, unique privilege given to only a few fellows every year. And for the record, Dr. Page was also awarded the Sarnow Fellowship in 1982. And my understanding is that he knew Dr. Rook back then. And, and, even, <laughs> and even back then, Rick shared with me that Dr. Rook knew that he wanted to become a vascular medicine expert. He's been the co-PI and PI on several uh, industry-sponsored studies, and in specific co-PI on NIH study looking at exercise versus revascularization for patients with claudication. His work resulted in 100 manuscripts, uh, first authored on 30, 79 book chapters, and four books on subjects related to cardiovascular physiology and vascular medicine. In addition to being a great clinician and researcher, he has also been a great citizen and has served on, as a member of many professional societies, including the American Medical Association, the American Association for Vascular Surgery, and the Society for Vascular Medicine and Biology. So today he's going to be talking about his favorite topic, vascular medicine. He just warned me that it might be a bit different than usual, so uh, we, we look forward to hearing that. The title of his presentation is The Seven Blunders of, uh, of the Vascular World. Test. Does everybody hear this? All right. This is going to be a different talk from the one that you thought you were coming in to, to hear. It's going to be the same subject, but it's going to be presented probably in a way we don't usually see. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, you've heard who I am, and I'm going to discuss the seven blunders of the vascular world. Forget everything you heard about my credentials. When somebody comes up in front of you to lecture, your first question should be, uh, you know, is this person qualified to talk about this subject? Am I qualified to talk to you about blunders? Well, if you don't trust me, you can ask the lovely Mrs. Rook. She will, uh, she will let you know that I am an absolute authority in this area. I I've made all the kind of blunders you can make. There's, there's the small blunder. Are you familiar with the small blunder? Um, you know, hey. Let's try that new Asian place for our anniversary dinner. You know, that's the small blunder. It, uh, it doesn't always work out the way you'd expect, but, you know, it's easy to fix. Just doesn't take much. You got it solved. Then there's what I would call the big blunder. The big blunder is a real problem. Um, you're going to take the dog for a walk. You say, dear, I'm taking the dog for a walk. And she says, okay, but watch out. I heard from the neighbors there's a porcupine in the neighborhood. And you say... Don't worry, the dog knows better than to mess with a porcupine. So this is, this is what you're going to call the big blunder, okay? You're going to hear about this at family reunions and dinners for years to come. But every once in a while, you make what I can only describe as the blunder of biblical proportions. Now, this usually involves a momentary lapse in judgment. Often your indiscretion is caught on camera. And, uh, well... Okay, how about this, for example? Now, here I am making a horrible blunder with somebody who is obviously not the lovely Mrs. Rook. Um, now, here I am. I'm caught on camera doing this. You know, what was I thinking? Now I have to go out and explain to my family, my friends, my kids that I was drinking light beer. <laughs> However, at least it's light beer from Wisconsin. <laughs> and, and that leads me then to, to where I'm going to go. I, when I come to a place, I always like to try to customize the talk to the audience in the locale. I googled the University of Wisconsin. What happens 
to the seven of the first ten sites that come up if you just blindly Google that. You get something to the effect of this here. Um, apparently you folks uh, know how to have a good time on this campus. So what I thought I would do to customize this is I am going to include a little party and drinking theme throughout this talk here. Um, now I'm going to offer a disclaimer. I'm not, you know, a lot of uh, errors are alcohol related. I've made most of them. I'm not endorsing drinking. I'm simply using a few of my own examples from my own life to show uh, maybe what you shouldn't do. And remember, it's okay because I am an expert in this area. I know a lot about mistakes. You heard about when I joined the staff in uh, cardiology. I joined in 1989. But even at that time, as a fellow, this is the first book that, that came out, the first dedicated book on interventional cardiology. If you can believe it, a fellow at the Mayo Clinic wrote the chapter on blunders here, the, uh, the vascular complications. I was already widely recognized as an expert in this field. In fact, I was asked to give a talk about complications that same year in Helsinki, Finland. Um, it took place uh, in June, and I, it's probably the same thing here, but whenever we cross the Atlantic, the way we do it is we work all day, I worked all day, then we go up to Minneapolis, we catch a plane at about 11 at night, and we fly across during the evening so that we can sleep overnight. The problem I have is I've never slept on a plane in my whole life. On this particular flight, things went uneventfully until I got to Amsterdam. And then as we were getting ready to land, we ran into a storm. I was diverted. Uh, my plane got canceled. I had to rebook. Lost some time. Luckily, I'd built some extra time in. Eventually got to Helsinki. There's a bus strike going on. I'm at the airport. I can't get to the hotel. It takes me three, four hours to get there. But finally, I arrive at the hotel. Note this, so I've been awake for two full days at this point. Helsinki's a beautiful city. What do you do whenever you get to a new city? Set your watch. You want to make sure you're at the right time. My talk's at 10 a.m. the next day. It's 7 o'clock now. I set it, and as I get to the hotel, I discover there's a restaurant and a beautiful little patio in the back where I can have a drink. I think this is fabulous. I'm not even going to check in yet. I'm going to have a beer and watch the sunset. So I have a beer, and luckily for me, the sun's not down. So I have a second, I have a third, I may have had a fourth. Now at this point, I want you to understand three mistakes. Uh, it's, it's seven o'clock uh, when I got there, it's now nine o'clock, my talk's not till 10 the next day, but three mistakes I made. The first involves this here. This is Rook's scale of alcoholic content. Notice that at the bottom here we have water, but actually under that is Michelob Ultra. <laughs> Then we've got things like beer and strong beer, things your mom drinks, things your dad drinks, you know, things that only your, uh, only your crazy Uncle Bob would drink. And then somewhere up here, finished beer. It wasn't quite that strong, but the point is it's strong stuff. The second thing is that I hadn't really learned my geography. Turns out that uh, Helsinki sits right here on the Arctic Circle. And in the middle of June, who knew this? Who knew? The sun doesn't set there. It just kind of goes down to the horizon and dips. So you know what? Day and night in Helsinki in June look exactly alike. And now comes the payoff because mistake three is I didn't set my watch right. Remember I said it was seven the night before my talk? It was actually seven on the morning of my talk <laughs> to a thousand people. It's now nine and I have to give my talk in an hour and I look, feel, and am acting like the late Nick Nolte. <laughs> immediately after a, uh, a driving pullover. Well, these are all mistakes, but if I may start with my talk here, I just want to point out that uh, they're not as dumb as some of the mistakes that we've made in the past. Uh, anybody here remember lasers for treating, uh, for treating uh, peripheral and coronary disease? Hot tip lasers were fabulously popular in the 80s, and if you were to read some of the material at that time, they were marketed very aggressively. Two years after the FDA said we could use them, we as a nation had performed over 20,000 procedures and we had over 300 freestanding laser centers. What drove this madness? Lasers are sexy. If you've ever tried to compete 
against, you know, Dr. Evil sharks or before that, you know, the Jedis with their lightsabers. As a physician, if you've ever tried to offer a, a therapy and you had to compete against the laser one, you always lose because people love lasers. And there was a thinking at that time that this was a proven technology. Well, was it? The answer appeared in books and articles later, but no. Uh, we quickly learned that the uh, laser wasn't as good as we thought, and it got abandoned into the wastebasket of history. I will point out, as some of you in cardiology may know, that there's recently been some new interest, the Ultraman study from last year here, looking at uh, lasers again. So what's old and bad idea may get recirculated. Well, as our young angiographer here is about to learn, uh, you know, there are all kinds of mistakes you can make. The hot tip laser was a classic one, but as physicians, it's, it's not the biggest thing that we've made. In vascular medicine, we've made a bunch of classic ones. I just want to share with you a few of them. As they say, we have the seven wonders of the ancient world. Uh, they've been updated to sort of seven wonders of the more modern world. This will be the seven wonders of the bl uh, blunders of the vascular world. Now, when I give a talk, I always try to organize it around a two-by-two -two table and a concept. And in this case, the concept is the idea. Ideas can either be good or bad, and ideas can either work or not work. So we're able to create a two-by-two -two table here. You can have good ideas that work, bad ideas that don't work, etc. And blunders can occur in any box. Well, my friend here is saying, oh, he wants to raise his hand, Rook, uh, good ideas that work, how can those be blunders? Oh, they can be blunders, my friend. <coughs> Let me tell you about a substance called pentoxyphylline. Now, pentoxyphylline is a methylxanthine, meaning it's like caffeine. And it's a hemorrheologic agent. If you take it, it gets incorporated into your red cells and makes them more flexible. So your blood is more slippery. It'll slip through blockages and capillaries easier. It's turning blood into water. And it was a very good idea for people with peripheral artery disease. When they tested it, it worked. In fact, it very quickly became apparent that people had about a 25% increase in their walking distance. This was statistically significant, and the FDA loved it. Almost no side effects. It works. It got approved. And in 1984, it became the only drug approved for treatment in patients with claudication. Now, over the next decade, a lot of studies confirmed that we were accurate about this. Uh, here's a meta-analysis, for example, looking at 12 studies. Walking distance increased by 48 meters, uh, so it absolutely works. But here was the catch. The catch was someone else looked at this a little different, came up with a slightly different increased walking distance, but when they compared this to things like smoking cessation, it was equally effective. How about something called nafronil, which is a, va a vasodilator that we used to use in these trials as a placebo. That works just as well. And exercise, my God, if you walk these people, they got four times the increase. So all of a sudden, we got to rethink this thing here. What does it mean to a claudicator to have your walking distance improved by 25%. Well, it means that four block claudication now becomes five block claudication, or that if you could walk 100 feet, now you can walk 125. How much of an improvement is that for an average patient? Rumsfeld says it's not very much here. But what were we paying for this little improvement as a nation? We were paying $200 million in sales for this drug in 19... 95. Kids, that's Oprah money here. We're talking about a huge amount. Is it worth this kind of cost? Well, we didn't have to think about it too long because shortly uh, after we started to think about this, another drug, Celastazole, came out and seemed to be more effective. So we stopped using Trental. But we woke up really in 2000 and realized we'd made a mistake. Yeah, Trental works. It just doesn't work very well at least not for $200 million a year. So that's a drug that works, but I'm still going to call it a blunder. Now contrast that. It's a blunder because it didn't work well enough. Now contrast this with something called sublingual nifedipine. Uh, there's 
Such things as hypertensive crises, people come into the emergency room all the time, they can have headaches, uh, papilledema, you can be in heart failure, you can even have CNS symptoms or even stroke. And it's important to get that blood pressure under control right away. Luckily, when I was a medical student, we knew how to do that. And, and we did it by using sublingual nifedipine. Is there anybody in here like me old enough to remember using, yeah, okay, a few hands are going up. Sublingual nifedipine, you had it in little tablets. You could poke it, they were filled with a little liquid. You'd squirt it under the tongue and the patient would take it. And this was the state of the art. Here's a little, you know, clipping from Ch uh, Chess Journal at that time, but it's what we did back when I was a student. And it was a very good idea. It was a good idea for this reason right here. Let's just say, for example, that your goal is a, a blood pressure of 120 systolic. Well, if your patient walked in with 240 systolic and you squirted some of this under their tongue, they came down right to where you wanted to. They did it in 15 minutes. And more importantly, they never overshot. They never became hypotensive. And I mean never. This was a simple drug to use. Uh, an article from JAMA at that time pointed out that it had been in wide use and that, yes, we had other drugs, nitroprusside, nitroglycerin, but these had to be given by IV. The patient had to go to an ICU for continuous monitoring. They were tough drugs to use. In contrast, nifedipine can be given orally and close monitoring is not necessary. So that's what we did. And it became part of high blood pressure for dummies. The problem, and I don't know why we didn't realize this, the problem was that our patients on this drug did horribly. You know what? If someone's been walking around with a systolic pressure of over 200 for days or weeks and you bring them back down to 120 over 15 minutes, they have worse, worse effects than if you left them alone. They stroke. We were stroking people, giving them myocardial infarctions, doing horrible things. This was too fast. The pharmacists recognized it first and tried to get our attention, but it really wasn't until almost a decade of use of this drug when journals like JAMA began to say, maybe we should stop doing this. And in fact, at this time, other drugs for blood pressure became available and they were effective. We really looked hard at sublingual nifedipine and said, we got to stop using this. And the drug uh, you know, dropped almost out of existence from the marketplace. It's now gone. So, what went wrong with these last two drugs? The answer is we used bad surrogate endpoints. With pentoxyphylline, we said that if we increase your walking distance, that'll increase your quality of life. You know what? It doesn't. We were mistaken there. And with nifedipine, we said, well, if we reduce your blood pressure, we'll reduce your risk. But again, it turned out to be a bad surrogate endpoint. In my career, I have seen many of these bad surrogate endpoints. When I first started in vascular, when we assessed graphs, all we cared about was patency. That was the end point. If it was patent, great. If not, bad. Then we realized you could have a graph close and still save a limb, or the graph could stay open and the limb could be lost. So we talked about limb salvage. And then it became walking distance. And nowadays, it's all about quality of life. That's the end point everybody's interested in. Think about, though, in your field of cardiology, that. Uh, what have we done as our surrogates for ASO? We've looked at cholesterol. Uh, hey, how's that HDL thing working out as a surrogate for, uh, for, for coronary disease? Yeah, it's, it's not as good as we thought. And now we're spending a lot of time focusing on calcification or carotid intimomedial thickening or even this flow-mediated vasodilation. We're treating these as if by changing them, we're changing atherosclerosis. We may be, but it may not be as simple as that. So there you go. One of these didn't work well enough, and one was a blunder because it worked too well. Well, what about this next category here, bad ideas at work? How can an idea be bad if it works? Well, when I was a resident, I was one of those good husbands. I would help my wife. We had a, our first baby in our small house. I remember one night doing the dishes, and I hear my wife call down and say, when you're done with that, you need to come on up here and give the baby a bath. And I, I thought about this for a minute. And um, <laughs> my wife assures me, she assures me that this was a bad idea. But you know what? I'm going to tell you that it worked. 
and it worked very effectively. Let me tell you about it, a medical example here, phosphodiesterase inhibition. The phosphodiesterase inhibition story is one about heart failure, bulging, jugulars, peripheral edema. Back in the 80s, we realized that cardiac cells would increase contractility if we could raise their calcium, and that uh, that depended on the amount of cyclic AMP within the cell, and that cyclic AMP was broken down by a, an enzyme called phosphodiesterase, and if we could inhibit this, we'd raise this and raise contractility. This is a brilliant idea. This is a great idea. And we came out with a couple of drugs right away, amrinone and milrinone, Older cardiologists may remember this. this. These drugs were going to cure heart failure. Uh, they were tested, and uh, what we discovered when we used these in people with heart failure was, wait, holy cow, reduced survival. They didn't do better. They actually did worse. In fact, Milton Packer did the PROMISE study out east and uh, really put this concept in its grave. These drugs, we don't know exactly why they didn't work, but a big part of the problem was side effects associated with them. They had a terrible side effect profile. Well, this news that phosphodiesterase inhibitors don't work for heart failure was horrible news to one company that was making a very late entry into this field. This was their phosphodiesterase inhibitor, and about the time it was ready for testing, it was clear that this wasn't going to work. So they thought about it, uh, this bad idea, and said, well, you know, it causes a little bit of vasodilation. Maybe it would be a good antianginal agent. So they tested it in patients with angina. How well do vasodilators work in patients with angina? In general, not very well. That's, and that's what they discovered, that in phase two trials, this drug didn't work very well with these patients. So this was clearly ineffective and becoming a very bad idea. How bad? Uh, it was like... Hindenburg bad, okay, because they had a lot of money invested in this. So they discontinued the study. Now, this is an easy thing to do. When you discontinue a study, you call up the sites and you say, we're giving up on this, send the drug back. Something almost unprecedented in the history of phase two trials occurred at this point. People didn't send the drug back. They started to get excuses like, well, I'd send it, but my dog ate it. Or, uh, you know, oh, somebody broke into the office last night and stole it. What the heck is going on here? Well, there was a little trial going on up in Canada that was nothing more than just a dose-response trial in normals. They were giving normal people increasing amounts of this medicine just to see what the side effects were. Did, did I mention that this was a bad drug? Because this was a bad drug. It had all kinds of side effects. Headache, nasal congestion. The more you gave, the worse they got. Indigestion, visual disturbances, your muscles ached. Oh, yeah. And there was one more side effect that uh, people weren't talking about, a change in erectile function. It turns out that the penis is loaded with a subtype of phosphodiesterase, phosphodiesterase type 5, that this drug was incredibly effective at inhibiting. The result uh, speaks for itself, and this became the largest selling drug of the decade. This is how this happened. So what went wrong here? Well, we have unexpected side effects. That's the punchline. Often they're unlucky. Most of the time side effects are not good like they were here, but every once in a while you run into a lucky side effect. And that's what happened with this drug, sildenafil. It didn't work at all, but it had a side effect that did. All right, well, next category, good ideas that didn't work. You know, the world is full of good ideas that didn't work. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce this with just maybe one little anecdote here. During my time at Mayo, I have uh, been one of the people that makes a lot of house calls to the rich and famous. When they can't come to Rochester, we go to them. And one morning, I got a call that one of our patients in New York had a rash and needed to see an internist, and I said, I'm on it, folks. So um, I headed off. Now, when we see patients, we're very snappy dressers, as you can tell, and we, uh, we always like to show up looking good. The problem is uh, that when we fly, they fly us like cattle class. So most of us uh, will just put our stuff in a suitcase and travel uh, 
uh, more casual. On this particular day, I was wearing my casual pants and my casual <laughs> shoes as I flew, and I had my stuff in a suitcase. You're thinking, oh, he's going to lose his suitcase. No, no, it's nothing that simple. It's not that simple. As I'm going through the Minneapolis airport, what happens is my fancy shoe begins to split. This is not my shoe, but this is the best I could do to show you what happens. I'm starting to get the alligator effect. So I hobble over to a shoe, sign, a shoe shine place, and I, uh, I, I explain my problem. He says, you would be surprised how often things like this happen, and I can help you. And he whips out some super glue. He puts it uh, you know, into here, holds the shoe together, and in 30 seconds, I'm repaired. I'm on my way. I head off. I catch my flight to New York. I take a taxi to where I need to be. And now all I have to do is the Superman thing. I've got my suitcase. I've got to run into the men's room, change, come on out, see my patient. I go in there, and I go to take the shoe off. It ain't coming. <laughs> it is glued. It is super glued to my foot from the big toe all the way to the heel. <laughs> and, and it is not going to be removed by any force short of amputation. Uh, now, what do you do in this situation? I've got about 11 minutes till I've got to see this patient. Well, I noticed uh, next to the building where I was going to see him there, I was able to find a uniform shop. I went in. I bought some pants to pull over my ugly pants, uh, a lab coat, some footy covers over my shoe, and I thought, I can pull this off. I'm going to walk into his office and I'm going to blow this guy away. I could not pull this off, all right? <laughs> this did not work as expected. But it does point out that even though this was a good idea, it didn't work. And we have lots of these things in medicine. The extracranial, intracranial bypass comes to mind. Everybody knows about carotid endarterectomy. Developed in the mid-1950s, you make an incision, you clean out the artery, you sew it up. Uh, highly effective, it works well. What's curious about it is that at the time that this operation was developed, every other arterial vascular bed in, in the body was being bypassed. Not endarterectomized, but bypassed with a bypass. And people said, well, why don't we try bypassing these blocked carotids? And you know, it's not that difficult of an operation to do. The, the blockages are always in the internal carotid. There's always an external. It's often good. The thought was, Let's make a hole in the skull. Uh, it doesn't matter how you make it. You just make it some way or another. And then take a, uh, something like a saphenous vein, hook it from the external carotid through this hole in the skull and tie it into one of the cerebral arteries. Voila, we have a bypass. It was a great idea. And uh, in fact, it was tested in 67. It caught on. And over the next... Uh, number of years, 10 years anyway, this extracranial, intracranial bypass became one of the most commonly performed brain operations in the world. All we needed to do now was just prove that it worked. And in 1977, we went out to do that, because this is going to be easy. It works everywhere else. They, uh, they collected this. It took 10 years to publish the data. That should have been a tip-off. And what they found when they did was that this was a failure. This operation not only didn't work, but people actually had 14% more strokes compared to medical therapy after, taking, after doing this. So it made people worse. Now, how on earth can something like this happen? Why doesn't this procedure work? That's the question everybody wondered. Well, first they accused the usual culprits. Oh, there were a lot of low-quality centers and rolling patients. Oh, there were low-volume operators, all the usual things. You know what the real problem here was? The real problem was this was one of our first big examples of bad randomization and overgeneralization. This study enrolled 1,377 patients, but obviously they had to screen a lot more to, to get these. And when they looked back at the patients they screened, they had at least 3,000. There may have been as many as 10,000 patients that were screened and were deemed to be so likely to benefit from operation that they were never randomized. They were just sent for an operation. The only patients that got randomized were ones where the physician doing the, doing the referring said, I don't think an operation is going to work, so I'll randomize them to this. Uh, you don't have to be an epidemiologist to understand that if you only randomize people that you think aren't going to benefit, 
it's really tough to show a benefit. So we realized this, it became a classic epidemiology question taught in all the classes uh, on statistics. And we went back and said, let's redo this study in 2011. It was called the COST study. Well, it made it for two years and then they stopped it because they realized early on they weren't gonna see a difference, it was futile. And the problem here was that uh, uh, it didn't uh, reduce the risk of recurrent same side strokes at two years. The, pro the reason was not because the operation wasn't working, it was for a different reason now. Better than expected outcomes in the medical control patients. And this is something we're seeing today all the time. Um, it's hard to look back at traditional studies uh, that showed a benefit over traditional conservative care when people smoke less now. We have statins, we have better antiplatelet agents, we have less obesity. The CREST-2 trial is being conducted. That's a trial of carotid stenting versus endarterectomy versus medical care because there are people now who think that just medical care alone for carotid artery disease may be as good as any intervention. Let's look at another good idea that didn't work the way we thought it would. Estrogen therapy for cardiovascular disease. You know, when we discovered that cholesterol was probably playing a role in cardiovascular disease, it took about 12 minutes for someone else to discover that, hey, if you give people estrogens, their cholesterol goes down. And, and at that time, the idea that if we could lower cholesterol and LDL, we could improve heart disease was sort of the dogma. So people thought, let's use estrogens in women to lower their heart disease risk. It makes perfect sense. My friend here is saying, uh, he's raising his hand already, uh, but Rook, uh, that's one of those surrogate measures that you said get us in trouble. It was, but these people were clever. They took it a step further. There were several studies that looked like this that appeared in the early 90s. This was the most influential. It, it appeared in all places uh, in the gynecology literature. But this was a small study, 232 women who had been taking estrogens uh, for 17 years. The investigators created a controlled match group, age match um, group that um, uh, didn't take estrogens, compared the two, and holy cow, holy cow, a 50% reduction in cardiac mortality in the group that's uh, taking the estrogen. Folks, you can't hardly show a 50% mortality reduction by bypassing left main disease. I mean, this is, this is like one of the biggest effects in medicine that had ever been noted. So articles like this began to appear, Annals of Internal Medicine. Hormone therapy should be recommended for women who've had a hysterectomy and for those with coronary disease or at high risk of coronary heart disease. And if you were a physician in the 90s and you didn't give your postmenopausal women estrogens because of these recommendations, people thought you were bad doctors. Now, this changed in 2002 when one of the largest trials ever uh, at that time to come out, the uh, Women's Health Initiative trial came out, 16,000 patients looking at the effect of hormonal therapy on a number of things, including cardiovascular disease. And lo and behold, they found that hormone replacement therapy did not produce the benefit that people thought it was going to do in cardiovascular disease. Uh, and the conclusions, of the treatment recommendations changed overnight uh, from you got to give it to everybody to don't give it to anybody. Part of this was that we discovered that these hormones are thrombogenic. This was part of the issue. But how else did we screw up on this? I mean, this seems like we should have never had a problem like this. A lot of people went back, analyzed this, and the overwhelming conclusion, uh, this was outlined in this analysis by circulation, was had to do with these women that were taking the estrogens and served as the study group here. It turns out that at that time, if you were a woman who happened to be taking an estrogen, you were almost certain to be more educated and more affluent than women who weren't taking estrogens. This became known in statistics later as the healthy woman selection bias. Uh, so what we learned from
from this particular study was that, yes, we had some potential for bad surrogate endpoints that could have led us astray. We had some randomization issues like we've seen in other studies. But the big problem with estrogens and the, where we got into a big mistake was that we failed to appreciate covariables. We didn't understand and correct for confounders like educational level and affluence and other things that not only favor good health but also correlate with estrogen use. I'm going to give you one more good idea that didn't work in vascular. Vitamins. Vitamins, especially the B vitamins for arterial disease. We learned also in the 90s that blood contained a substance called homocysteine. And if there was one thing that the medical community, the scientific community could agree on, it was, home, it was that homocysteine was bad for your arteries. It enhanced oxidative stress. It damaged endothelium. It caused atherosclerosis. We knew this. We knew this with certainty. We also knew something else, that we could lower in virtually every person their homocysteine level by giving them B vitamins. You gave them that, the homocysteine went down. You do not have to be a rocket surgeon to understand that just, you know, the idea of that we could give this and it's going to make our atherosclerosis better was a no-brainer. And people loved vitamins. Vitamins were the greatest thing in the world. Vitamins aren't drugs, right? I don't take drugs, doctor. I don't take any medicines. I take vitamins. We handed out vitamins like crazy. We had vitamins for kids, vitamins for women, vitamins for men. This is a no-brainer. So what did we find out when we did the trials? Well, people around the country, as soon as this hypothesis you know, became obvious, around the country, heck, around the world, began uh, immediately to set up multiple, multiple, multiple studies to look at the effects of these B vitamins on uh, atherosclerosis. And what we found in every study, including every study since then, no benefit, no benefit at all to folic acid and B, B vitamin supplementation in the prevention of cardiovascular events. Now, what went wrong? Well, one of my favorite uh, cardiologists, and some of you may know him out at Harvard, is Joe Lescalzo. And I love Joe's take on this. Joe said, well, I could explain it. The straightforward but incorrect view that folic acid can decrease homocysteine levels and therefore reduce the risk of atherosclerosis may be an unintended consequence of oversimplifying a complicated medical network. If that's a little complicated for you, let me explain what it is. It's over-reliance on what we have now called evidence-based thinking. Or put even more simply, it's mistaking what you think you know for what you actually know. And we still do this constantly. You know, one of the first examples of evidence-based um, utility in the business world was in 1957 when all of the automobile companies decided that they were going to build their next round of automobiles based on the public's input. If we know what the public wants, we can build what they want. Uh, so they went out, they uh, surveyed the public, and got evidence and found that the public wanted luxury and low price, sophisticated technology, and something in terms of styling that was unique. And what did they do with this information? They built some of the greatest cars that have ever been built using this evidence. <laughs> 57 T-Bird, <laughs> the 57 Chevy, and the 57 Vet. I'm getting excited up here. <laughs> but what else did they build in 1957? Yeah, they built the Edsel. With this same data, with the same data, somebody sat down and said, well, this is what this data says, and I have the evidence to prove it. And it was the biggest, most costly error in the history of automotion. Ford didn't know what it thought it knew. And that leads us then to this last category of bad ideas that didn't work. Uh, the world is full of bad ideas that didn't work. Unfortunately, a lot of them do involve alcohol. Um, these are things you should not do under the influence of alcohol. You should never drive. This is a horrible thing. Do not handle guns under the influence of alcohol. Uh, don't get a tattoo. That is a very bad idea. And for do not get married under the influence of alcohol. This is bad. There are, on the other hand, certain things that we should always do under the influence of alcohol, one of which is fishing. You should always go fishing with alcohol on board. You heard about some of my stuff. I've also written and published a number of kids' books. This is from a kids' book that I didn't get published. <laughs> 
My wife thinks it has something to do with all the alcohol that the two heroes drink. Incidentally, you know, you always have to be, you have to pick good heroes for any kid's book. Now, obviously on the right is me there. I, I, you know, I sort of look like a cartoon character. And for this guy on the left, I just picked somebody that uh, I knew. I, he might even be in this room. I don't know. But he sort of resembles a uh, cartoon character. But Fishing with Al is all about friends and fishing and drinking. And that's what I was into when I was in college, friends and fishing and drinking. This is the only existing picture of me as a college student. There was a house fire, everything got destroyed. But when I would, when I would come home, uh, I would try to come home on weekends and go fishing with my friends. And on this particular day, we had caught a bunch of fish and we were returning to my house. We'd also consumed uh, a, a lot of malt beverage that day. Now in my backyard, we had a combination shed garage, which my father used as a workshop. The problem was he was not a carpenter. He wasn't anything. He, he, had, he was the world's worst at whatever it is he thought he was. This was his toolbox. And in 17 years, I had never seen him open or use this red toolbox for anything. But this shed was great because we were allowed to have parties in it, as long as I cleaned it up and took care of it and got it ready. So. On this particular day, I arrive home from fishing with my fish. We're a little bit late, and we know our friends are coming over for the party, and i got to get things ready. Now, I suppose in retrospect, what I probably should have done was clean the fish and then got the shed ready. But under the influence of a few adult beverages, I had a better idea. What I thought I could do since I was running late is I would put the fish in my dad's unused toolbox. Trust me, this was a brilliant idea at the time I thought of it. And then I'll come back and clean them later. So that's what I did. We got the shed cleaned up. I've tried to capture for you what a rook party in that shed was like. It was, uh, was it, it's not your usual event. And there you can see uh, my toolbox hiding over there. As the night goes on, things get a little weird, you know, uh, at the party. The toolbox gets moved a bit. But don't worry, don't worry. The next morning, I got up and did exactly what I knew I would do. I went back to college. I forgot all about those fish. Oh, and by the way, the way my team is playing, we no longer uh, show that logo without a disguise. <coughs> the, um, we went back and uh, I went back to school. Now it turns out, no matter how many times you recycle your underwear after like a month or two, you've got to do a load of laundry. So this was about six weeks later, I came back home with a load of laundry and as I'm pulling up, I notice they're jackhammering the floor of our shed. And I ask my father, what's up? He says, oh, right after you left, some animal must have burrowed underneath there and died because it's been really smelly. Well, I can see the toolbox sitting there. I know exactly where this smell is coming from. And I don't know if it's a father-son thing or what, but I, I didn't tell him for 10 years, and he was still mad at me <laughs> when, I, when I let him know about this. Was... Well, that leads us... Bad ideas that didn't work. This is where we'll finish up here. You know, the biggest problem with this category is you don't really know a bad idea in medicine right off the bat. Sometimes you think it's bad, but uh, it often is good until it's not good. Here's some arguments that, uh, you know, I've seen out there. Just, I mean, just think about these things, you know, of what we're telling people. Everybody in this room should be telling people to cut down their sodium except that, you know, since 2012, we've been suspicious that maybe sodium uh, doesn't need to be cut down. And in fact, I pulled this out for you, April 10th, 2018, a month ago, in the Lancet, not everybody needs to cut back in salt uh, in order to reduce their risk. Maybe we're wrong about some of these things. Rita Redberg here, uh, you need to read some of her views. You're a San Francisco man there. She has some very novel thoughts about uh, statins and their role in heart disease and how we might be wrong there. Um, uh, diet soda. What could be simpler than saying, hey, don't drink all this sugar. Let's, let's go to diet soda. Well, people who drink diet soda might have as much as a 60% higher rate of cardiovascular events. Who knew that would be a bad idea? Um, and this was just from, gosh, I don't know, last week here, 826, from a European study Maybe low-dose aspirin for first time, you know, for primary prevention of cardiovascular events isn't going to work. I mean, the, these are things that 
seem like good ideas when we suggested them. Just for this audience, I noticed this two days ago. Whole fat dairy may reduce risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, I wanted to bring some good news to this thing. But, but again, it's contrarian thinking that suggests that some of the ideas we've thought were good ideas for a long time may not be as certain as we think they are. They may turn out to be bad ideas. Anybody here involved in this? This was going to revolutionize my field. Renal artery sympathetic nerve denervation. You put a catheter in there, you fry the inside of the renal artery, you cook those sympathetic nerves, and you basically denervate the kidney. And by doing that, we were going to control blood pressure, sleep apnea, hyperglycemia, uh, polycystic ovary disease, all of these papers came out because this was such a great idea. In fact, not that I would ever mention anything bad about the Cleveland Clinic, but <coughs> the um, Cleveland Clinic in 2011, when they listed their top 10 medical interventions for the year, put this as number one, catheter-based renal denervation. Well, it bombed. It was a very bad idea, although people now think maybe some confounding variables may have played a role here and they're going to look into this again and try to restudy it. So I'm not going to go into any more than that. I guess I'm just going to simply leave it at this point with the idea that some ideas are bad. We just don't need to spend a whole lot of time looking at all of them. Um, I'll give you a, a final parting example of this. <clears throat> this is a patient of mine. Uh, he, he's got very severe claudication. You shouldn't be surprised. See these calcified arteries? Look at that. He's got bad claudication. And I I've been following him for years and telling him, protect your feet. I'm not sure that if you injure your feet, you've got enough blood flow in there to get things to heal. Well, I didn't see him for about three months, and he shows up sheepishly on crutches one day with these pins in his ankle. And I said, well, I told you to be careful. How'd you break your leg? He says, Doc, that is an interesting story. I'm glad you asked. Now, now, it turns out he's been married almost 50 years to the same woman. She's got this B-52's hairdo thing going on. Uh, and her mother told her when they got married, when your man gets home at the end of the day, you get yourself gussied up for him. So she has had this ritual almost every day for 50 years. She goes upstairs right before her husband returns from work. She gets out this hairspray, and she sprays her hair and makes herself look nice. On this particular day, the nozzle of the hairspray can jams, and it's spraying all over the room. So cleverly, she gets a, a good idea. She goes and she lifts up the toilet seat, holds the can there, and sprays the can until it empties completely in there. When it's done, she puts the lid down. Good idea. All right, well, about three minutes later, her husband returns home. Turns out that he, too, has a little ritual after work. And on this particular day, he feels it's necessary to evoke that ritual right away. So he runs upstairs, and he sits on the toilet. Now, you remember these arteries here. I'm going to point out that you don't get arteries like that without working at it. And yes, he does smoke, OK? So he's sitting on the toilet, smoking. And he says to me, Doc, the last thing I really remember clearly, I took that last drag, and I dropped it between my legs. <laughs> He's blown off the toilet, into the wall. Uh, his wife hears this horrible commotion. She comes running upstairs. Oh, my God. She calls 911. The ambulance gets there. Two guys come with the gurney. It's a very narrow stair. They get up. They load them on. They're moving them down the stairs. The guy in the front here says, what happened? And this guy starts to tell him, well, he laughs so hard he drops the front of the stretch. <laughs> that is how the man broke his leg. All right, so this will be our, my, my final pause here. I'll summarize. The seven blunders of the cardiovascular world illustrate the six biggest reasons why we do the wrong thing in cardiovascular practice. We look at the wrong surrogate endpoints. We overlook important side effects. We randomize wrong and we generalize improperly. We fail to recognize key confounders. We think we know more than we do. This is a little chip shot at evidence-based medicine. And we ignore obvious consequences. And if we would just stop doing that, we wouldn't make mistakes. So thank you very much.
you for the excellent talk. Questions? Do we have any questions? I told them I didn't think we'd have a lot of questions, but every once in a while there's a historian in the room. Yes. Yes, sir. I need you to repeat the question. Oh, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that it's a good thing, it is a good thing. But, but um, I guess the, the comment would be that uh, there are almost certainly some downsides that don't get as much advertisement as we want. It's, it's probably not a perfect diet in, for some circumstances. People will probably oversell it in some situations. Um, you know, I try to adhere to a plant-based diet as much as I can. So, yes, I think there are good ideas. And hopefully people understand that there's a, you know, a little you know, tongue-in-cheek in all of these examples that we've looked at. But, uh, uh, for example, how many patients have we cured of atherosclerosis by switching them to a plant-based diet? I haven't cured any. I'm not sure anybody has. So, well, yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know, you know, is, and, and then the question becomes, is that the way we're going to live? I, I, I don't know. These are very complicated, you know, difficult questions. So it's a good one, though. It's a fair one. Anything else? Beg your pardon? Can you speak louder? No? Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Oh. Thank you very much for the excellent... All right, well, thank you.